right. All right, it is three o'clock. So hi everyone, welcome uh, to the April 21st meeting of the RTD Accountability Committee's Operations Subcommittee. Um, I would be remiss if I did not just mention the, the current state of where we are um, just in our, in our country. Um, I know uh, at least for a lot of folks yesterday was a little bit of a sigh of relief, um, especially for those in our black community, um, followed by tragedy immediately afterwards. So I, I just wanna acknowledge that and just in recognition, especially with the heavy topics that we all work on um, to make our region more equitable and to make transportation serve everyone in our community. So just wanna start that off as some grounding for today. Um, in terms of the agenda, I am gonna start off by just checking in with folks and seeing if there's any comments or questions related to the April 7th operations meeting. Um, summary, which is in your packet. We'll then transition to um, the recommendation on pass and fair programs. And I, I wanna uh, just preface that conversation by providing some context before we move into administrative items. So um, in terms of the agenda, I just wanna check in with members of the committee to see if there's any comments, questions, clarifications on the meeting summary from our April 7th meeting. All right. Seeing none, we breeze through that one. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, dive into the discussion item. Um, so I am gonna share my screen briefly just to kind of ground us in the conversation for today um, and really share that today, the recommendation that was in your packet is just that. Um, my attempt at taking the, the conversation that we've been having for the better part of, of this committee's existence and just starting to formulate some potential um, bumper lanes and things for us to respond to. So today's purpose is, is to have more of a dialogue and make sure that we are, um, you know, that we're headed in the right direction. So I am gonna share my screen. Can folks see my screen right now? PowerPoint. Yeah. All right, I see head shakes. All right. Um, so just as a reminder, our committee goals, um, which are provided in the packet, um, that was uh, the interim report, I should say. Um, the first one is assess and make recommendations on how RTD fares and past programs can be improved to increase equity, ridership, affordability, and ease of access. Um, throughout this committee, we've had some touch points related to fares, passes, and service delivery, and really the intersection between all three of those. And so just as a reminder on where did we start and what have we talked about, um, I apologize if this is a little bit um, blurry to see, so I'm just gonna read it out loud. Um, as a reminder, last year in November um, and in December, we received some, some grounding and some learning around what fares look like within RTD. Um, as a reminder, in um, December, we had a special presentation from, or actually I should say in, no in November, there was a presentation on the LIV program, an overview of how that's working, that's the low income fare pass. And we also had, I apologize, um, an overview on fair freeze and what other uh, peer cities had been using. In December, the Transit Center presented to this committee a framework for fares and really started to lay some of the groundwork for what I think eventually came up as our um, operations dashboard and this dashboard conversation that we've spent the last couple of meetings focusing on. But it really started with fares, fair policies, and um, fair evasion practices. So that's where we spent our meetings in December. In January, we focused on fair administration. So the cost of fair collection, the business perspective from anchor institutions. So we had the Auraria campus present to us and, and share a little bit about their pain points and opportunities when it comes to the past programs from an, as an employer and as someone that um, hosts students. And then peer agency comparison, and, and I know Natalie Shishido with CEDA and others presented some information. February, moving along, uh, fair box recovery ratio. We listened to the auditor recommendation, again, really formulating what would eventually become our, our dashboard recommendation to outline some potential metrics to assess how well are we doing in terms of ridership, in terms of fares and passes, and in terms of really getting the work. So that's really what's led us to today. All of that, just a reminder, there's a lot that's been happening. We've learned a lot, but now it's time to apply this into some potential recommendations. 
Also, along um, this pathway, we've had a lot of uh, amazing community feedback and insights from Boulder County, from different anchor institutions, other local employers that have shared with us um, in, in the larger public meetings, what they're experiencing and what they would like to see as part of some potential recommendations in terms of fair passes and service delivery. So in your packet, I have the recommendation that was my best attempt at taking all of this whirlwind of information and trying to condense it into some sort of recommendation. And what you see on your screen are just the high level bullet points. So I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly, um, wrap up this presentation by just sharing some discussion questions and then we'll open it up for discussion from this committee. So the first recommendation that you see is consider um, the recommendation for RTD would be to consider a single reduced or discounted fare. As we've learned multiple times, the fare program or the discounted fares really kind of fluctuate anywhere between 40% for the low income fare all the way up to 70% and then 50% for seniors and um, those with disabilities. So um, what's been mentioned several times is a consolidation of all of the discounts to a single discount um, to really make it easier for users to get on and off the system and um, not have to navigate the complexities of trying to figure out which fare uh, discount do I qualify for. The last, uh, the second bullet point or the, the bold on the screen um, is explore an opportunity to implement a family fair um, program or pass program. This was mentioned during um, one of the conversations around uh, anchor institutions and some local school districts lifting up that for a lot of families, um, sometimes the parent just wants to pay for all of the kids passes on one pass. And I guess that's not available at this moment. We have to pay the youth fair, and then um, if they happen to have an eco pass, you know, pay for pay with their eco pass. So um, this idea, or at least this concept of what would it look like for us to have a family pass, um, kind of came up to really build um, kind of family ridership and the next generation, I would say, of um, transit users. So not just focusing in on the youth fair. This would allow, again, the family um, to use a family email versus a school email. So eliminate some of those potential administrative challenges on the youth fair side. Um, the second, or the, on the next slide are again, some additional recommendations that get to some of this service delivery, but also the fares um, components. So explore the use of either the zone-based or distance-based regional fare um, to determine local versus regional. I think a lot of folks have lifted up that this is a question. This would be a recommendation that RTD could explore either of them. We know a lot of questions still exist about this, but again, just something for exploration. Um, identify strategies to streamline and simplify the PASS program structure, or the um, yeah, PASS program. So NICO, ECO, Eco Pass structure, Nico neighborhood Eco Pass, and then the the um, college pass program. So we've heard time and time again that folks are really confused. We've heard from small um, small organizations, small businesses that they'd love to participate in this, but it, they can't quite find a way to engage in it. So um, that would be uh, the recommendation there. And then the final one is around convening anchor institutions and um, large employers to really just on an annual basis to better understand. Um, modifications to the programs and really have an opportunity to be more iterative in how RTD um, looks at their past programs and structures. That's again just taking all of this whirlwind of information and trying to consolidate it into some form of a recommendation. I breezed through that and so I have some discussion questions on this screen but I'm going to actually um, turn off my screen sharing before we move to the discussions and just maybe have a little bit more of an open dialogue among the committee members because I know each of you have I think heard different things and when we listen to public comments we hear it in different ways so it'd be great to kind of hear from folks maybe what are some initial reactions um, and if folks from RTD and or Dr. Cog want to chime in you know, we also want to welcome that opportunity before I open it up to the committee, again, just as a preface, the purpose of this recommendation is taking the whirlwind of information from November to where we are today and trying to formulate some kind of recommendation that this committee could present potentially to RTD. So, 
committee questions, comments, <laughs> reflections. Right. I'll get it started. Uh, the, there's one thing I noticed when we were talking to other groups and looking at other organizations, the idea of a flat fare really in, is attractive for being able to expand ridership. And the same thing is true to eliminate the zone considerations. It seems like at least one of the organizations that was talking about that said that their revenues actually went up when they went to a flat fare mm -hmm. because they got more riders and, and there were fewer people that were confused about how the system worked. We have a really complex, we not only don't have flat fares, we also have the idea of a zone, you know, zones and how those zones impact things. So, you know, I, I think the flat fare, if we can find a way to do it and not hurt RTD in terms of revenues, uh, that it's worth exploring. That, that's the other side of this as a chair of the finance subcommittee. You know, RTD's in a tough enough situation. It's important to try to find ways that we can do things that will not have a major significant impact on revenues. Now, right now, the revenues are so low for fares compared to what they have traditionally been because of the, you know, because of the pandemic that, you know, maybe it's a good time to try something. Mm. We need to bring those people back too. That have dropped. Thanks, could, could I ask Deborah a question? One thing I've really been curious about, do you have any idea what the ridership is on the weekend compared to weekdays? I know it's lower on weekends generally, but. Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head, but when we did the route modification, we originally had gone to Saturday service across the board just because of the, um, the shuttering of businesses and activity centers. Um, and so not recognizing I was going to get that question. I don't have that information readily available, but we could share that at another time. I think it's worth considering, you know, are there trade-offs where we could, we could give benefits on, on the you're talking about off peak. Work. Yeah. That that's yeah. commonplace because exactly. what you're trying to do is better to have a bird in the hand than a bird in the bush. Right. So for all intents and purposes, um, traditionally, you know, when there was a standard commute time, you may look at the shoulders where there were certain pairs and then it's a lot less during midday because you have a tendency not to have as many customers utilizing your system. So that that's something that's that's commonplace. I think just as a reminder, Rhett, I think we did cover the peak off peak. This is going back to this like memory. <laughs> um, I believe we covered that in December, possibly at the January um, operations committee meeting. I don't know that we got into the level of detail around ridership on, on weekends versus weekdays pre-COVID, but that may have been part of the service delivery conversation, which I think was in November, October. If you have a strategy that focuses on using the off-peak as a benefit, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like for example, throw this out, what, what if you said uh, that if you hold a pass on a weekend, uh, you can take two of your kids with you for free. Hmm. Or you could take one other adult with you for free. So you could, you could take, you know, a single mom could take her kids downtown for a festival that's going on in Denver or in Boulder or wherever else, or to a game. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it wouldn't have a negative impact on RTD's revenues. So, and it would also get the kids acclimated to the idea of transit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was one thing I thought about in terms of how do you, how do you use that resource of underutilized uh, trains and buses on the weekend mm -hmm. to build ridership? Because in the end now, uh, RTD will be measured by the legislature based, based on ridership. That'll be right. the, one of the key measures. And so you got to get ridership back up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to go to Elise and then I'm going to actually call on folks. So I'm going to go to Elise and then Kristen and Chris. Sure. Thank God I volunteered before I got called on. Uh, <laughs> first, I just want to uh, just give a shout out to you, Dave, for uh, the incredible work you're putting into this. Um, really appreciate it. I think the work on fares and passes 
will be some of the most important work that the the committee does. I think it's so essential um, to increasing ridership, both to recover from COVID and to actually go beyond where we were pre-COVID in terms of filling up our buses and, and uh, rail cars. Um, I, I um, had forwarded some, some suggestions from the Boulder County folks and um, also just wanted to raise some, some thoughts and questions throughout all of the recommendations, which I think are a great start. Um, I think that overall, I, I think we've recognized that that the, the fares for RTD are too high. And so reducing them wherever you can, I think is a useful thing. But beyond that, really um, being where you can use fare for you close to it for key demographics. And I, I look at the um, doing a single reduced discounted fare makes sense. I'd be interested in looking at the groups that you, you know, take them to fare free. Um, because I, it, my understanding is that um, youth and seniors and disabled are a pretty small subset. I have a little less clarity on how much the low income population would be. Um, I, I uh, but barring that, I love the idea of making it simple and very, very discounted. Um, I also, the, the notion of eco passes, as you know, Boulder County has done a lot of experimentation with that. Um, it makes sense, I think, to um, provide a discount for eco passes when you purchase them, because you're, you're basically pre-investing into the transit system in a predictable manner that I think is beneficial to RTD. And we know that once you have a pass, you're more likely to ride the bus or the, or, or the train. Um, I also wanted to throw in a couple of um, ideas that, that I don't know if we've, we've gotten to. One is the issue that we've experienced with our um, housing authority here in Boulder County, that we have groups of low income, um, uh, permanently affordable housing, um, We'd love to have a single master eco pass for them all, rather than having to do the administrative burden of trying to do, you know, a handful of homes here and a handful of homes there. I think that we should look at these master eco pass contracts, similar to how we're doing, I think, with some businesses, to facilitate multi-location entities to use eco passes. The other thing that I don't know that we thought about yes yet is whether or not um, we could look at interagency passes. Um, you know, if you have an eco pass on RTD, can you use it um, with another transit agency? You know, could bus tang, what have you. Can there be some coordination between those to um, raise the raise all transit votes, if you will? So those are just some of the the um, ideas off the top of my head on on this really comprehensive set of recommendations that you're putting together. But I'll stop there for now. That's um, that's really interesting, Elise. I, I, I was but I was thinking about what like this kind of master coordination across different transit agencies would look like or and even across micro mobility or um, other kind of opportunities. I know other agencies are trying to explore that. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I see, um, before I go to you, Kristen, I see Brian came, Brian Welch came on. Um, so Brian, I just wanted to check in with you quickly to see if you you had a comment or something. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, for the opportunity. Just real quickly, my recollection when we introduced the current zone fare system that, that's currently in place with the introduction of the University of Colorado A-Line, the... Uh, Acknowledging all of your input on fares is, is very, very helpful to us because we concur with many of the reactions that you've had. The current zone structure and the differential in fares by distance was predicated primarily on when you introduced the service out to the airport, it was regarded as perhaps more of a premium service, but also the distances that are traveled between Denver Union Station and the ends of the line. The calculation worked out that if we had a flat fare to meet the financial targets, the fare would have to be so high that 
it didn't pass the disparate um, impact and disproportionate burden requirements of the Civil Rights Act. So I'm not saying we couldn't, you know, explore further. We certainly can and, and are willing to do that. But that remains a challenge for a district where you'd have to figure out how you could justify charging the same for a trip that's tens of miles to. So could you charge the same for a person who's traveling from Denver Union Station to the airport as the person who's traveling from the Auraria campus to Civic Center? That was our challenge back then. And that, that's the origin primarily of how the zone system that you see in the current uh, fare structure came from. Hope that's helpful. It's all definitely open for um, further analysis and discussion though. Great, thanks Brian. I, um, that's helpful context and, and um, history. I also wanna encourage the committee, like as we think about recommendations and the, again, the purpose of us is it, of our body is to make a recommendation and explore it um, to the extent that we can, but ultimately RTD can, can continue to explore it as it makes sense internally. So I'm gonna go Kristen and then Chris and I'll check in with Crystal. Thanks, Daya. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. It's, it's interesting what Brian was saying about the fares to the airport and how they, RTD really had to look at it as far as if people were going to have to pay a fare by distance, that the amount was going to be pretty disparate. Uh, just for an example, for a person on Accessoride to get to and from the airport, it is $20 each way. Hmm, okay. Then you throw on the $100 a bag for luggage and then the airfare and everything else. And a person like me, it is really hard to come up with that $40 for a round trip fare to and from the airport. I know a lot of that is the airport fees as far as getting on and off the airport grounds, property, whatever. That's how it was explained to us by RTD. But that's two years ago, I think it dropped to 1750 and then it was at 20, then it was at 21. I, I don't know why it keeps changing every year to get to and from the airport, but it's it's pretty outrageous. And um, thank you, Rut, for bringing up the other transit agencies that found when they went to a flat fare that actually ridership went up. When I was doing all that research on the different transit agencies and what they charge for paratransit, it's really hard not to get go down rabbit holes when you go on people's websites and I was in rabbit holes everywhere I went. I think it was Washington State that made the comment that as soon as they got rid of their very complicated fare structure, that the ridership went up. So as you were saying, Daya, once you start talking about 40% off for the LIV program, 70% off for I think students, 50% off for seniors and people with disabilities, it gets very complicated. And if you want to change everybody to 50%, that kind of just levels the playing field. And I really think that people would be less confused and more likely to get onto the bus. Now I am old enough to remember when <laughs> you had those little coins, the little tokens to get on and off the bus that was ridiculous. You're carrying around pocketfuls of these little tiny, less than penny size, whatever copper coins. It was hilarious to get on and off the bus. But I, I firmly stand behind the let's even out the playing field as far as the fares and not have the three or four different fare structures. Um, thanks for that insight, uh, Kristen. I, before I turn it over to you, Chris, I do want to mention just really briefly in terms of the recommendation, one point around um, the single kind of flat reduced discount fare. 
within that, um, just to raise, I think, a, a, a point that Elise mentioned earlier around free fairs and kind of exploring what that would look like to just offer that to youth. Within the proposed recommendation that I um, at least submitted to the committee, um, a fair, a free fair would be offered for youth between newborn to 10. Um, and that's basically elementary school age. That was very much based on, um, uh, I would say more, more of an acknowledgement or a nod to my, my, my organization's previous tenure on the past program working group and an acknowledgement of some of the administrative challenges that I know um, RTD at least had, had expressed um, with regard to implementing the youth fair at, at that time. I think we could probably look at it a little differently. So I just wanna um, acknowledge that kind of line within the recommendation, especially if we wanna broaden it out and just say, what would it look like for us to provide free fairs for, every, for folks within certain um, populations, so youth, folks with disability, low income, what would that look like? Um, so I, I just wanna acknowledge that one little sentence and then say that we can completely open that up and kind of encourage us to do that as a committee. So um, I'll go over to Chris and then Crystal for some initial reactions and feedback. The day I was just thinking to myself, we're all like, let's make it simpler. And then God bless Elise, she wants us to do a new deal with all the affordable housing community, community in Boulder. And Kristen needs us to solve uh, real and legitimate challenges on the A-line out to the airport. And it's totally legitimate that it doesn't cost the same amount to ride from, um, uh, I don't know, pick your spot, um, uh, you know, from the, the, the Civic Center to Union Station connection or whatever. I mean, it, so it is, it is definitely an intriguing uh, challenge. It, for me, what I like about your stuff is keeping it simple. I, I think it's a little bit, uh, it's interesting for us to make suggestions, but I also recognize there's a lot of complexity to it. Um, and so for me, I, I actually think the stronger we can be to RTD and in our recommendations around simplicity, the, the, that is the more important message. And, and would hope that as staff and the team at RTD started to focus on this and you know accept and focus on these recommendations that they would keep that as a principle in mind. Um, and so it, rather than getting too specific from our recommendations on fares, it, I would love to keep it as uh, high level is not the right word because I actually think simple is super important. So, um, and I think our opinion at least seems universally formed here that the simpler the better the easier for companies, small, big, large, whatever, to buy a monthly pass at a discount, the easier for Rutt to buy one and take his grandkids. I think you have grandkids, Rutt, I don't even know, but the grandkids, <laughs> yeah, the grandkids don't pay. Like, you know, the, the simpler, the easier to understand, the better. So uh, that that's that's really where I sit. And I think that you're starting to get at that, but all of us have, have a hard time resisting the temptation to pick a thing to say this this group needs attention and i think that's definitely a challenge that civic organizations have to deal with and i i know you've dealt with this a lot and and i will i will finalize by saying i do think the real thing here the purpose of the fair structure is to increase ridership and that that is its first and most important goal and then the challenge of course is is balancing that with equity and I have a total appreciation for that challenge. Um, so I think that it, I'm not giving you an answer per se, but just trying to sort of frame what I think is the important thing to pass on in our recommendation. So hopefully that makes some amount of sense. That does, thanks Chris. And I also just wanna acknowledge again, it, we're, we're balancing multiple competing interests and trying to find at least one possible solution or path forward, um, I think really centering on ridership and the rider, the user of the system and how they engage, I think is, is really what I'm, I'm holding and how do we do that in an equitable way? Crystal, before I turn it over to you, I do see that Actually, Deborah has- yeah, I had one other thing that I wanted to add. Um, I do think if I understand correctly, the benefit of passes is massive. It is predictable ridership. It is predictable income for the team to the extent that we can find a bunch of suckers. By the way, this is the entire business model of Hulu. 
who will just forget to turn off their renewal and, and be a friend of RTD and pay, you know, whatever every month to keep a pass for their two rides and just not worry about it. And there are lots of those people um, and their entire industry is built around that model. So I do think pass revenue to me has an incredible value um, that is diff that is that is a benefit to RTD, a benefit people who are more than willing to pay hundred dollars a month, and there are lots of them, guys, who are more than willing to pay hundred dollars a month to just not deal with it. And so I and by the way, oh oh by the way, suddenly they show up more because hey, shoot, I've got the pass, I might as well use it. So I do want to say that pass income to me sounds it has a lot of value versus the complexity of a daily ride um, ticket. So that was that was the other thing I wanted to, I'll use your word, elevate. <laughs> like I've stolen it from you, totally off topic. I now say it all the time. So <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> Sorry, there you go. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, Deborah, I do see that you have your hand raised and then Crystal, I do wanna give you a moment to, to share some initial reactions and thoughts. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And I really appreciate this robust conversation around fares. Um, it's no secret I have said publicly that I too agree that our fares are very cumbersome, hard to discern. Um, and if in fact there was a simpler fare structure, I believe that we could yield some great dividends from that. Um, while I welcome all these recommendations, I do want to manage expectations as we talk about looking at things through an equity lens. And um, with that, recognizing what Brian Welch said earlier about the whole aspect around uh, what we have to do in compliance with the Civil Rights Act, specifically Title VI, i.e. fair and service equity, Executive Order 12898 as relates to environmental justice, um, what I am intending to do um, in very short order, recognizing I convened a cross-departmental working group here in the agency just late last March, um, whereby I charged them with coming together and creating a common set of facts as we lay the groundwork around FAIR and FAIR programs um, by conducting a robust FAIR study and a FAIR equity analysis. And so with that, I want you all to know that it will be the first of its kind for all intents and purposes for RTD, as it will include extensive multicultural outreach, uh, leveraging culturally specific community organizations, serving the BIPOC communities, um, youth, seniors, people with disabilities, the unhoused, veterans, the LGBT community, as well as a multitude of other approaches. And so this will enable us to really hone in on what it is that may work as we go forward. So I just wanted to share that with everybody because that is going to lay the groundwork for how we go forward, recognizing that the FTA does allow us with their guidance via the circular that they released back in 2012 that clearly states that there's an exception to a fair equity analysis being a six month pilot project. What I have seen here that we have leveraged pilot programs and then people are a little you know, dismayed, a little frustrated when RTD can't continue on with said pilot because a fair equity analysis has not been done for the entire service area. So with that as the backdrop going forward, we plan to leverage this um, in the May timeframe. I shared that with the board last evening. I will be disseminating information from which I'm getting from my cross uh, departmental matrix team about our path forward. And quite naturally, we want to hear from everybody. We're going to ensure that we're, you know, using, you know, safe harbor languages as we outreach to people because there's like 20 of them in the region. Um, so just given that as a broad brush. So thank you for the time to share that, Madam Chair. So much, Deborah. Um, Crystal, I see that you are on mute, but I do want to give you the opportunity to share as well. Yeah, thank you, Dea. Um, and I appreciate the way that you have been running this. And I think it's an incredible accomplishment to get where we are now. I, I recall all of the conversations and how lengthy they can be and just this back and forth. But my initial thoughts, um, I, I don't think are very, I guess, dissimilar to what has already been said. The great thing is that this is not, this is the culmination of this past year's work. 
Um, so I feel confident that we've vetted this with the, the right organizations, the right groups, and certainly um, there's always room for, for more and more conversations and more improvement. But um, I just, I don't see these as necessarily competing. I wanna, um, I, I, I respect the, the comment that Chris made around the simplifying. And I think I, I see these as like, maybe not happening all at the same time <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> Um, and, you know, hopefully this is, you know, enough guidance for, I guess, the folks who actually have to do the work, um, Deborah and team um, and the board to be able to make sure that, um, you know, it's a sustainable system and that we do have um, robust ridership. But I, I like what I'm seeing. This is, um, I think it is in the vein of simplifying, consolidating, making it easier from a user perspective. and. I, I think that we've tried to center that perspective in these conversations. So um, I, I like these recommendations and I guess would echo a lot of what has already been said. Great, thanks. So I am quickly going to share my screen again, just to give you all a sense of what I have been capturing in terms of some potential refinements to the recommendations just based on folks' comments. Um, generally, in terms of the discussion, it, it seems like we have general consensus that we seem to recommend, uh, we seem to agree on most of the recommendations. Of course, they could use additional refinement and that's perfectly fine. Also just acknowledging that these are recommendations. So it's not hard, fast, set in stone, but again, just something that, that gets the conversation moving forward. In terms of what needs additional refinement, at least what I've heard in the conversation, so I, I made those in red. Um, so I'm gonna modify this a little bit, but um, consider a just a free fare for equity populations. Again, we'll unpack this a little bit more, um, kind of explore what that actually means. Acknowledging that this is again, just a recommendation. What would it look like? What's the cost? Um, what would that impact look like? The other um, recommendations that have a little bit of tweak and refinement. Um, so identifying strategies to streamline simplify pass structures. So I've um, incorporated some of this master pass in coordination with other agencies. So I'm just lifting up, um, Elise, uh, your point around affordable housing, kind of how do we make this, just streamline this or somehow make this easier, opening it up a little bit to get that. Um, this is, I, I don't like to use this term, but the regular customers, the regular businesses, um, which in this case would be affordable housing. So we have some step, some level of stable income coming in for RTD, at least that's how I see that pass. Um, explore the, the master eco pass program. Um, the other point that I kind of heard in, in implicitly, and I wanna just check in for clarification, but what I've heard implicitly in some comments um, and also just other comments along the way has been that it's, it's challenging at the moment for agencies, nonprofits and affordable fair or affordable fair, affordable housing groups um, to upload fair um, resources onto an EcoPass card. So I've added that into this, again, just as a nod and a reflection that this is something that we have heard on a couple of points. Um, the other, the last point that I just um, mentioned, Deborah, this kind of hits to your um, comment and what RTD is already doing, but just convening community businesses, anchor institutions on a regular basis to kind of assess how the passes are doing. This really gets, um, at least from my perspective, so some of the equity and ensuring that we are Again, centering community users, um, those that rely on the public transit, regardless of, of the, the hat that they wear, um, to ensure that the programs continually meet their needs. So I, I'm going to do a quick temperature check in terms of, again, these are, these are refinements that will continue to need to be refined <laughs> because they were done iteratively as we were discussing. Um, as you see these, these refinements and the recommendations now, I'm just curious if, and we can do this popcorn style, if folks have any immediate reflections on what these refinements might potentially mean. Chris, I see that you unmuted yourself. So I was I just, just gonna to ask you if you could go back to slide four again, sorry. Yeah. All right, and then and five, Elise, we're done, yeah. um, I see Elise unmuted. You unmuted yourself, so I just wanna check in really quick. Well, you know, I just wanted to jump in the fray. I, one of the things that I appreciate the modification you made, I think that's, those are all great. One thing that I didn't comment on that I feel like is a huge and 
great idea that we hadn't talked about is the make eco pass available to every employee through a transportation fee, which is essentially making transit free for the workforce and designing a revenue stream to pay for that. And that's something that, you know, uh, Boulder County has often fantasized about having a, a countywide eco pass and has done you know, uh, analyses of, you know, how you might pull that off and pay for it. And one of the ways that you could do it is through employers. That is a big idea. It would require, you know, a vote of the people um, uh, to actually, uh, you know, make it happen. Um, but I also think it's a really compelling idea to figure out how, you know, how, that would be a game changer if everybody who worked and quite frankly, at that point, you might I mean, you might get it to everybody. Anybody that's looking for a job probably needs free transit too. Um, just what a game changer that would be if everybody who had a job could ride transit for free, for free um, and what that might do. So I just wanted to highlight that I thought that um, it was interesting to, uh, and important recommendation that we haven't really talked, but it would change a lot of the other recommendations by um, superseding them, if you will, in a, in a really game changing way. Yeah, I do think that's important. And just to lift up, um, th this is very old data and very old information, but in terms of the, the airport, um, you know, one thing that we we had heard from community organizing partners you know, back in 2016, 2017, is that many of the employers at the airport, while they do offer an eco pass, it's usually for the higher income employees and not necessarily for those that are working in the service level jobs. And so if there's a way to kind of explore that so that we can mitigate some of these unintended consequences of, for example, uh, you know, fares and structures, how do we get passes really into the, the hands of all employees in the region, um, not just those that are higher income? Um, Rhett, I do see that you unmuted yourself. I, I did. I wanted to comment on the airport pass uh, concepts because, you know, I, I do see that. I see articles about how tough it is on employees out there the amount they have to pay just to get back and forth to work. Uh, and, and I think that one, one concept we might consider that might get us around this is, is if you said, if you have a pass, you can go to the airport, anybody that has a pass. Somebody getting off an airplane who's a tourist doesn't have a pass. And, and one of the things that essentially you could do is say, it, those people, here's how you get on it's $20. And if you want three or seven days or whatever of, of extending your pass, because every time I go to, to some other city, large city or foreign travel or whatever, first thing I want to do is I want to get a transit pass. And so if you can get it all at the same time for those people who are going to want to ride the train anyway and are more likely, you could say $20 to, to have, you know, to use the, airport service plus 25 if you want a three-day pass or or 30 if you want a seven-day pass. A lot of people would just sign up for that. I think there are a lot of travelers for whom they don't want to have to deal with a transit agency, but there are people who, especially overseas visitors, who use transit systems all the time and would be more likely just to sign off to it. That way, it's we would be able to give a benefit to all of those people who have passes, one more reason to have a pass, one more reason for employers to buy a pass for that person because they don't want them parking at the airport and turning in $40 worth of parking fees or more. So I, you know, going to what Chris was saying about how do you simplify it, that's real simple. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, Lynn, I do see that you came on camera. I just want to give you the opportunity. Um, seem like you may have something to add as well. Yeah, thanks, um, Daya. I think that uh, I'm a huge fan of the passes and um, would like to see it, at least uh, for us to explore when we start the study, uh, not coupling it too closely with employment, um, partially for the Title VI reasons, you know. Um, one of the knocks on EcoPass is that it gives a discount to people who are 
um, who are less in need of it. And um, I'd love to see us try some things. And, and I don't know how these would work, but you know, maybe there's money out there where we could partner and give an, pick some neighborhoods, some low-income neighborhoods and, and uh, get the eco pass out to them. I certainly think that um, all the affordable housing areas in the district um, should be ripe for putting together uh, an eco pass, sort of like along the lines that um, Elise was talking about, and uh, um, really, you know, expanding it in in uh, some of the ways that get to our uh, um, more essential workers and, and uh, low income people that need to keep riding. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. I do see that Julie, who is a member of the Governance Committee. I, um, Julie, I'm not sure how long you've been on, um, but I just want to check in with you just as a member of the committee overall um, to see if there's any initial reactions to at least what's coming up as the um, potential recommendation on fares and passes. I don't have anything to add, really. I just got on maybe about couple minutes ago, so sorry I was late. Um, but I really like the idea about um, making it easier to use, and I, I love this past idea. So I think that um, it could really just help folks, you know, streamline that ridership. Great. Um, I thought you may have just recently joined, but I did want to just give you the opportunity to chime in if you had any additional thoughts. Um, so in terms of next steps on this uh, recommendation, a couple of things that I do want to share, um, or at least as one final prompt, I will just say this before we move into kind of next steps and, and kind of closing out. Um, for members of the committee, it would be great to hear from you some initial reactions in terms of, you know, as you look at these high level pass and fair recommendations, what seems to provide the most immediate visible result, and then what may provide um, more long, long lasting effect. So I just quick reactions in terms of initial um, thoughts on what's gonna provide the most immediate visible result, and then what um, might provide the most long lasting effect. I will do this in a call out fashion. And so I will start with Kristen, Chris, and then Elise. I think the uh, the the one that people will respond the best to and the most to would be the consolidate the discounts. I also agree with the um, you have in in quotes family fair program. I like that idea a lot, and I think that would get a lot of response. Chris, Elise. And I'll go to Crystal and Rent. Well, I hold. I for me, it's Dad's sim simplicity. Simplification, yeah. Great. Am I next? Yep, Elise, Crystal, Rent. <laughs> Well, certainly if you make um, anything fair free, I think that will have immediate jolt to the system. Um, as well as maybe the long uh, lasting impact of changing behavior over the long term, but certainly making passes more widely available, um, I think will have the impact of helping change long term behavior in a positive fashion. Um, Crystal? Yeah, I would agree that um, the, I guess the most immediate impact would be the free or reduced fares, especially because the populations we're talking about, um, I think would, um, like I think of like high school age students that rely on transit, you know, to get to education, uh, uh, to get to their schools and such. And then um, I think the simplification of the passes as well. I know that they're highly utilized um, with, uh, different, at least with educational institutions. And I know that we, we put them in kind of the anchor institution category, um, but I think at least there, that's a consistent group. Um, you know, universities have target class sizes that they meet every year and that doesn't change. If anything, it, it expands as opposed to, um, 
reducing and um, like, for example, at the University of Denver, majority of our students are from out of state, so they do not have um, another means of transit um, besides a public transit. So I just think uh, from a, you know, sustainability and just consistency that that would be really impactful. Thanks. And Rhett, what seems to be the most immediate visible results and what might be, um, what might provide the most long lasting effect? Well, I think it's, <clears throat> It is a, a bit of a subtle thing, but if there is no way to auto renew a pass, as, as Chris said, like the Hulu model, there are a lot of people that once they're in there, they got them. And why would you not do that? It's not gonna help, you know, low, real low income people or anything else, but it's gonna help RTD maintain a revenue base that they might otherwise miss out on and that helps everybody else have good transit. Great. So in terms of takeaways and next steps, um, so in terms of the recommendation, generally it seemed like everyone was in agreement the, that they, they are at least a good first step. We will need to continue refining them, obviously, just um, as uh, we discussed. So I'll make those couple of tweaks. Um, in terms of high level takeaways, focusing on simplicity across fare and pass structures, I think is, is our main recommendation. Simple, simpler the better. Um, acknowledge that the primary goal is to increase ridership, especially with a fare box recovery ratio, no longer as that kind of outstanding metric. So what's that new metric um, that we're using, which connects back to the dashboard that we've, we've been talking about um, previously. Um, the other takeaway that I'm lifting up is focus on community experience in how they relate and utilize the passes and fares. Again, going back to the first point on focus on simplicity. So centering the writer, the user of the system as the primary customer or consumer. Um, and I think that's, those are at least my high level takeaways. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, I will continue to refine this recommendation. What I would like to do is a little bit of homework on this committee um, in that if you, uh, as we refine this, um, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the recommendation, just again, for additional tweaks or modifications, um, please let me know. Um, but again, I would appreciate any additional feedback that you may not have expressed within this, um, within this meeting um, so that we can continue the discussion and continue to move this recommendation forward. Um, Elise, I see you unmuted yourself. Can you... Um, email out the, the new recommendations to the committee so we have a fresh yes. set to look at? Yes, I will take what we've discussed today and transpose that into the, the Word document so that we have a new document to work from um, that acknowledges the conversation from today. Awesome, um, thanks. Yeah, all right. Um, in terms of additional items, I wanna check in on member comments or other matters. Is there anything else that folks would like to discuss today? All right. I am not Actually, yes. I just realized I forgot to mention something in the recommendation. I apologize. Um, the pay as you go option, I don't know, we've discussed it a little bit, but um, could be an alternative to eco passes that would be really helpful and more equitable where you know an agency or company only has a small percentage of people who want eco passes um so just to throw that idea back in the heap i will plug that into one of the simplifying path structure as a potential strategy that we might want to explore there um if you do have additional comments or kind of more color to the to that recommendation, please feel free to include that um, in the second document, Elise. Um, I am not seeing anything else from this committee and I do not have any other matters for us to discuss today. So I think we are going to wrap up five minutes early. All right, awesome. Thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. Uh,